Hi, everyone, and thanks for attending my talk. Um, so I will be talking about alternative promoters and how to study them with uh, long read sequencing data. Um, just as a bit of an introduction, um, my group at the Genome Institute of Singapore looks into transcriptomics data. And to illustrate why, why we think that is really interesting, I want to show this figure here. This um, shows the human organism, and there's a lot of different tissues. And the reason why we're interested in RNA is because RNA is really what differs between all those different cell types and what enables this diversity of cell types in the human um, body. And so all of these cells have the same DNA. First, really, is the RNAs in the cell. And therefore, we have all these different possible cells that all have different properties. And it's not just about understanding these cells. It's also about understanding um, changes that happen when there is a disease such as cancer, as the RNA are often uh, among, among the first that change. So we also in the, uh, studying that with high throughput technology from transcriptomics. So look, to look into that in more detail here, I show um, um, a small image of the human chromosome 5, and I selected one region in particular. In that region, you can see there's two genes. The first gene here on the left is transcribed in, in the direction shown by the arrow, and then there's another gene transcribed in the other direction. And so often, we talk about gene expression, and gene expression describes really the process of generating a gene product from one gene. It also implicates that there's really just one product from one gene, and that is most often not the case. So to show how that looks for this um, image here, really both of these genes use a lot of different isoforms. And so based on the number of these isoforms, uh, you can already appreciate that there's really not just one gene product, but that there's really a lot of different possible ways that this gene can be transcribed. And what happens also is that um, even for the same gene, the gene product can have uh, possibly a usually different function. What happens after transcription is that these RNAs are spliced into the form. Even in the same gene, some of those can be non-coding or even um, then protein coding. And depending on the usage of these exons, you also see that the protein structure differs and therefore the function of these RNAs. Understanding these different eyes forms in the cell is really important. And what I will talk about today is about the promoter, so the choice of the start site. What you can see here is already that there's a lot of different ways that these genes can be transcribed and where transcription can be initiated, and that directly impacts um, the structure of this, um, RNA, so the, the RNA isoforms that are um, generated. To illustrate that a bit more, I'd like to show this example here of a gene that's uh, well known in cancer, that's ERBB2. ERBB2 has a number of promoters. I'm just showing two here. But you can already see that depending on the part of the uh, thing, RNA will be different. And so that might have a consequence. And therefore, it might be really important to understand um, which promoter is active. And that's what we were interested in this project. To really try to find out how often are alternative promoters used and what's the impact of using alternative promoters. This project was mostly done by a PhD student in my group, Dennis Timmercholu, and it's a collaboration with Patrick Tan, also from the Genome Institute of Singapore. Now here we wanted to look into alternative promoters in cancer. And so if we want to study alternative promoters, the first thing we would think about is what kind of technology in general. And there are um, technologies that are specifically designed for that purpose, such as chip sequencing or cage tag sequencing. Now, those are really helpful. They can be very accurate. And they would exactly tell us where are these active promoters that we're interested in. The limitation here is, of course, that these are experimental approaches, which means we either have to generate data or we have to use the data that's publicly available. But for these two data sources, um, that's not necessarily on a very large scale. And so as a computation team, we work a lot with publicly available data. And for this project, we were actually involved in an international collaboration in an international consortium that was called the, um, the Pan-Cancer of Whole Genomes, um, the Pan-Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes Consortium. Uh, that consortium was really about the whole genome sequencing of cancers across 
27 cancer types. They looked into more than 2,600 samples. And RNA seq data available for 1,200 of these samples. This was a massive effort involving more than 700 scientists, and there was also clinical data available. So there's really a huge amount of data. And these are the kind of data sets that we would like to study promoters in. But unfortunately, there's no ChIP-seq or CageTech data, so we can't just use those existing technologies. And so what we wanted to do was using these data to identify which promoters are active. And so I've introduced actually the, how we study the transcriptome and the different isoforms for each gene. And this, of course, is directly related to the choice of promoter. The idea that we then had was maybe to use the RNA-seq data to identify which promoter is active. So I want to show one example of why that is um, in principle possible, but also why that is challenging. This here shows two genes that are transcribed in antisense direction. You can see they're heavily overlapping, and it's, of course, difficult to identify which of these isoforms are active from short read sequencing data. This just shows such a sequencing track. The challenge is that some of these reads are assigned not uniquely to one isoform. And exactly identifying which isoform We'll also be able to identify which promoter is active, as we can exactly identify the isoform with a promoter. But because of these challenges, that might not be robust. So if we apply isoform um, estimate, estimation to this example, we get something like that, where each of is one of these isoforms for these two genes. You can see that there's really um, a lot of these isoforms are estimated to be active, and that's partially related due to the uncertainty in assigning these reads there. Okay, so there's a lot of uncertainty, and that makes this problem challenging. Now, it turns out for promoters, actually, there's a few things that we can do so that we're able to deal with this. So I want to introduce the method that uh, Dennis from my team has developed, ProActive. ProActive was designed to estimate promoter activity from RNA. So here I show one gene that has four different isoforms. I want to use that to illustrate how that method works. This gene can also be illustrated with what we call a splicing graph. This graph we can construct by um, creating edges and, and, and nodes. The nodes will be the start and end of the exons. So you can illustrate that here also in that isoform view. And the edges will then be the exons or the introns. And in addition to that, we add this root node and also the leaf at the end so that we get this complete graph here. And this graph represents this gene. Now, there are four different isoforms, and each isoform is one possible path through that graph. And if you want to estimate isoform expression, you have to estimate the expression associated with each of these graphs. Now, that can be challenging, and that's partially due to things like, for example, the edge between 9 and 10, which is shared with all those isoforms. Now, for promoters, there's a few things that really help. And the first thing is, if you look into that gene here on the left, there's four different start sites, but actually the first three are very close by. And in fact, from RNA sequencing data, the resolution is not very high at the five prime end. And therefore, we might not even be able to distinguish those three transcription start sites. And therefore, the first simplification that we make here is that start sites that are very close nearby, we group them together. And so the second simplification that we then do is that we only use those reads that are maximally informative to distinguish between these different alternative promoters. And it turns out those are exactly those reads that um, uh, map to the splice junctions that are unique to each of these promoters. And so instead of having to estimate isoform expression for all of these individual isoforms, now this problem is really reduced. So we essentially look into just a small part of that graph and that makes this um, a bit more easily solvable. So this is proactive. This method is implemented and available through Bioconductor. And with the help of a fantastic student and my team, there's also a very nice workflow um, available, worked by Joseph Lee. Out. And you can try that. It should be nicely documented. If you have questions, you can also always reach out to us. So this works on any set of RNA sequencing data. It's fast, and it's also um, easy to use. And so what we can do is we can now really apply that uh, to any data set that we want. 
the first thing we did is we were looking into some of the public data sets from ENCODE. Now ENCODE has data that involves um, both chip sequencing and RNA sequencing. So that's a perfect data set to really test how accurate proactive works. And so here we use H3K4 charm isolation, which is typically seen at promoters. And we calculate the correlation of promoter activity estimate from these chip seq data sets and from those RNA seq data sets that we estimated with proactive. And in this heat map, what you can show in, in red, this is when the correlation of these two matching cell lines based on RNA and chip seq is the highest. And you can see a lot of the points are on the diagonal. This is when the RNA sequencing is most similar to the estimates from chip sequencing data. So this really illustrates that we can use RNA-C data to obtain the promoter activity estimates that are comparable with ChIP-seq. But of course, we don't need to do any experiments. Once we have RNA-C data, we can just get these estimates really directly computationally. And because of that, we can apply this to not just the Peacock data set, but we can essentially apply this to a large amount of data that's publicly available. And so we, here we apply this to more than 18,000 samples that include samples from the Pan Cancer Analysis of Full Genomes Consortium, but that also includes samples from TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and also from GTEx, the Genotype Tissue Expression Project. So in total, there's this large number of samples covering 42 cancer types and a lot of different tissues, and a lot of these samples also have clinical data available. So that scale is possible because of the availability of RNA sequencing data. So if we apply that and we estimate promoter activity for all these samples, the first thing we see if we generate this kind of T-SNE plot is that they actually cluster by tissue. And that's largely expected. And that is also what we would see if we would do the same analysis with gene expression. So that's not so surprising because essentially promoter activity just captures gene expression. But there's also something in addition to gene expression that we get. And this can be illustrated in the following plot here. On the x-axis, that is the average gene expression. And on the y-axis, that is the average major promoter activity. So a point that's on the diagonal, these are genes that just use one promoter. So the promoter completely explains the gene expression. But all of these points that are below the diagonal, those are genes with a major promoter does not completely explain the gene expression. And so these are genes that use alternative promoters. And that's something that we can now really study in detail. To illustrate how that looks, I'd like to show this example of a gene that is called GJB1, and that has two possible promoters. And what you can see here in the, in the top uh, line, that's the expression from the central nervous system. And you can see that these tissues use uh, the second promoter, whereas all the remaining tissues essentially use the first promoter. There's very clear distinction in which promoter is used. But if you look at the overall expression level, actually, the expression is essentially very similar. So if you would just look at gene expression, you would not see that there's any difference. But if we look into the promoter activity, we can see that there's a very clear change. And that, of course, might potentially have functional consequences. Now, this is one example, but we observe, of course, many more. We do see that these alternative promoters are used specifically in all of these tissues that we studied. So there's a lot of alternative promoters that we can detect that otherwise do not show any change in overall gene expression. Now we can also ask um, what's the relation of, between promoters and isoforms. And one thing that we see is that a lot of these promoters actually are directly connected to a single isoform, which means the choice of the promoter already defines the isoform expression. So there's a very close relationship between uh, transcriptional regulation, so the choice of promoter, and the RNA is, that is generated. So not all of this diversity that we observe at the isoform level is due to the splicing process. Once the promoter is decided, splicing is then a, a post that is then a post-transcriptional process. And so it's really closely connected and frequently determined pre-transcriptionally. If you look into these major isoform switches, we also see that again, that um, really a large fraction of isoform switching appears to be closely associated with the choice of promoter. And so splicing, of course, is important, but it really shows that splicing is just one aspect of generating this huge diversity of isoforms that we see in the cell. And so one more aspect that we also looked into is what is actually the consequence of changing the promoter. 
So if we compare the major isoform to the alternative isoform, we do see that it, of course, affects the sequence of the 5' UTR. That's expected. But you also see that it can change the coding sequence and the 3' UTR. So the choice of promoter really might have an impact on even the structure of the protein and other things. So there seems to be some kind of regulation that goes beyond just the selection of the start site. So the next thing we wanted to look into was finding out which um, of these promoters are associated with which cancer types. And so we compared cancer with normal samples here. And so we did that um, by first matching the expression of tissues. It's not obvious all the time which cancer type to match to which healthy tissue. And so we first did that based on this clustering. Things that we couldn't match in any good way, we removed from this analysis to avoid any large mismatch between tissues. But based on this association, we can now compare cancer and normal tissues. And there's a few interesting things that we can see. And so this heat map here I like to show because, of course, all of us have seen a lot of heat maps. We work with gene expression data. That's one of the first things that we would always look into. But this heat map is different in the sense that all of these genes that we show here do not overall show a change in gene expression. It's really a specific promoter that has changed. And that's here for kidney cancer samples between cancer and normal. Here at the bottom, you can see the first graph, that is the change in the alternative promoter, and below that, that is the change in gene expression. So we can really see changes at the level of the promoter that's not reflected in gene expression levels, and so things that we might otherwise would have missed. We can also look into more details within a specific cancer type. For example, in breast cancer, we can see that there's different subtypes that are specifically associated with the choice of promoters for some genes. So by ranking genes by the, the specific promoter, we can discriminate these subtypes even within a single cancer type. We can also look into the opposite. That is, we look into promoters that are associated with cancers across all of these different cancer types. We do see examples like this gene here, which has the this promoter too that's generally expressed in healthy tissue, but that seems to be um, reduced in, ex in, in expression in a lot of the cancer types. And again, that's something that's very specific to this promoter here. It's not a change in overall gene expression. Okay, so one of the reasons we looked into these large-scale data sets also that there's more data available. It's not just the expression data, so the promoters that we see, but we can also associate that with the other data that's available. And one of the interesting things to look out, of course, is um, clinical data. So here we looked into patient survival. And so what we did is we identified for each of these promoters for the gene, the top 10% um, outlier patients that had the highest promoter activity and compared that to the lower 90%. And then we calculated the significance uh, whether there's a significant difference in these um, two um, groups based on the expression threshold. So we did that, all the promoters identified the one that showed the highest significant association and compared that to the remaining promoters. And that allows us to find out whether there is an association at the level of the promoter or whether that association is generally, uh, um, whether we observe that uh, as a general trend for the complete gene. What we get from this is the following figure. Here on the x-axis, that is the adjusted p-value for the association of, with survival for the alternative promoter. And on the y-axis, this is the significance of the association for all the other promoters. So there's a few points here on the diagonal. Those genes are really genes where the gene expression is associated with patient survival. You can also see these points you highlighted in orange that are very close to the x-axis. And those are genes where there's a very specific association observable only for this alternative promoter, whereas all the other promoters do not seem to have a significant association. And so that brings me also back to the first example that I wanted to show, that's ERBB2. So these two promoters here and lower-grade glioma patients, and what we see is that for the first promoter, there's essentially no significant association, whether this promoter is highly active or lowly active. Uh, we do not see this association with survival. However, for the second promoter, we do see this association and it's clearly significant association, which tells us that this promoter specifically can discriminate patients that show um, poor survival, poor prognosis from those that show a better prognosis and better survival. Now, as you can see, this really is specific to the promoter here.
So there's one thing that we know about lower grade glioma, and that is that there are also certain mutations that frequently occur. And so we can also look into that as these also might explain the same association with clinical um, uh, survival that we see. And so that also illustrates again why it's so nice to work, be able to work with these rich data sources that not just have one data type, but multiple data types. And so here we are using the mutation data from the genome sequencing data. And so in lower grade glioma, there's a few genes that are frequently mutated and they're partially also mutually exclusive. So you can see these two groups, the one with IDH1 and P53 and the other one with EGFR and the P10 mutation. And so then we group that based on their um, co-occurrence with the ERBB2 P2 promoter activation. And so we do see that there is clearly an association and that could tell us also that this um, association with survival that we see could also be a downstream effect based on changes in, in these genes, these mutations might introduce um, regulatory changes. And so the observation that we have for EBB2 might just be downstream of that. And in fact, if we look into the mutations, we do see that there is an association with survival for IDH1, for example, whether the recent mutation is present or not, really tells us about the patient survival. Okay, so the question is, how does that look if we now remove those patients that actually have a mutation? For patients that do not have a mutation, and these four genes. Can we still use the ERBB2 promoter to discriminate survival? And yes, we can see that it still um, is predictive, indicating that this expression data, this specific data for this ERBB2 P2 promoter can be informative even in the absence of uh, mutations. This really suggests that there's something more. It's not just downstream auto mutation, there's really an association here that seems to be highly informative. Okay, so that's the first part. To summarize that really, I've shown that we can estimate promoter activity from RNA sequencing data. We see that iTerm promoters uh, display tissue specific regulation and that they impact isoform diversity. And we study these scans associated with promoters. And often we see that these are independent from gene expression. So we would easily miss that if you only look into gene expression. And then one thing that I really think nice illustrates this association of um, promoter activity is uh, when we study survival, you can see that some of those might be predictive and that this uh, association with survival is specific to the promoter and again, not observable at the gene expression level. Okay, so this uh, paper was uh, published, so you can read about it. You can also try this tool. Uh, one limitation here is that this is specific to annotations. So we rely on the annotations of promoters to be able to estimate them. So that brings me to the next topic. I've mentioned already, I want to talk a bit more about long read RNA sequencing, which I think really will make a huge difference to um, transcriptomics. And one of the advantages, of course, is that we can go beyond gene expression. Now we can start to look into individual isoforms. Here you can see the same example with the short read sequencing data. Of course, it's difficult to associate these reads with these transcripts. Reasons are, among others, that there's a lot of specific biases that we can also measure and that we can partially deal with, but these really make it difficult to identify which isoform is active. And so we can do more replicates, but it might just be the same. So replicates do not necessarily solve that problem. So if we look into long read data, what we can see is that there's really this association here between reads and isoforms that greatly help to identify which of these isoforms is active. And so it not, not only helps with that, it also allows us to identify new isoforms, things that are not present in the annotations. And so for the next um, few minutes, I want to specifically talk about this project, which is uh, actually where I'm a collaborator. So it's mostly done by Patrick Tan and uh, Huang in Patrick Tan's lab. And that was also recently published. And here we looked into long read transcriptome sequencing data for gastric cancer. We've been using the PEC Bio ISOSeq system. So that system involves, of course, uh, data generation, but it also involves this pipeline which generates um, high quality isoforms. And the system has the advantage that it's um, accurate. And so the isoforms that we get are of very high confidence. So compared to short read data, really the advantage is that we can get essentially full length reads assigned to these um, isoforms. And we can also use that to identify new isoforms that are present in the RNA, that are not present in the annotations. So for this project, what we did was we sequenced 10 gastric cancer cell lines. 
And they were chosen to really reflect a bit of diversity in terms of gastric cancer. They included chromosome unstable cell lines, microsatellite unstable cell lines. They also included two EBV positive cell lines and a genome stable gastric cancer cell line. Each of those was then sequenced with four flow cells, generating about 26 gigabyte of raw sequencing data. And uh, in total, we get about 27,000 non redundant full length ice forms per cell line. So here in B, what you can see is the different kinds of ice forms that we can get. In black, that shows the reference. And in red, these are the ice forms that perfectly match in terms of splice junctions to the references. And then in green, we have these partial matches. That's something that can um, possibly be a false positive. Those might be very interesting, but they are also a bit more difficult to study. And so we particularly look into these um, here shown in blue and in purple. Those are the new isoforms that either use existing junctions or that even use new junctions. And so one thing that we see is that if you look into all these isoforms, many of the isoforms that we get from these data sets are essentially not annotated. So these are novel isoforms. And so if we compare this across all the cell lines, the more data we add, the more isoforms do we identify. Now, those that are annotated, they seem to saturate at some point, whereas those that are not annotated still increase. And that's partially expected, of course, because annotations really are a very specific set that reflects a certain um, data set that was used for these annotations. And there's, of course, a lot of limitation on what can go into annotations. And so the more we sequence, the more new isoforms we will get. Now, this does not necessarily mean that these are all highly expressed or that all of these are functionally important, but it really illustrates that there's a huge diversity and not all of that is reflected in annotations. Again, going back to this example of ERBB2, you can also see here what we get in terms of new isoforms. On top here in red, that's shown what's annotated. And then in blue and purple, we can really see the number of isoforms that we can observe that are not annotated. And so there's a huge diversity here in addition to what's annotated. So different types of splicing events. Of course, I've talked a lot about alternative first exons, but there's also alternative five prime and three prime splice sites, alternative last exons, intron retention, exon skipping, or mutually exclusive exons. And with these data, look into all of those. But one thing that we see is that the alternative first exons, so the alternative promoters, seem to be the most frequent event that we can observe. And so one thing that we also see here, and that's similar to what we observed before, is that the choice of promoter impacts not just the 5' UTR, but also the coding sequence and the 3' UTR, really indicating that there is this close relationship between transcriptional regulation and the choice of isoform and gene product that will then be generated. So one aspect that's interesting here is, again, that we can use these annotations and then look into data that's um, available, publicly available. Because there's so much short read RNA-C data, we can now use proactive to estimate promoter activity using these new annotations, but on existing data. We can also estimate activity on the long read data. That also works well. But of course, the advantage with publicly available data is that we have such an amount of rich data resources. And so that's what we then looked into next. And so here, what you can see on top, that's the data that we get. We analyzed. Um, promoter activity in TCGA samples and, and samples from a Singapore cohort, specifically looking into gastric cancer and using proactive again to estimate promoter activity. But different to what I presented before, now we can use these annotations from the long read sequencing data, and that really allows us to identify promoters that are not in the annotations, that are not present there. And so promoters that might have been missed in the previous analysis. And so one thing that we see then is that um, really there's quite a few of those. And I want to specifically highlight the association with survival, survival again, because it really nicely illustrates this relationship here. So what we looked into is the association with survival for the novel promoter and for the known promoters. And we observe, of course, all these kinds of possible scenarios. There are genes where the gene expression, again, is associated with survival. And there are some where just the annotated isoforms are associated with survival. But we also observe cases where there's really a novel promoter it has not been described previously. It seems to have an association that was not otherwise observable. So to illustrate that in more detail, this shows three examples here. 
on top, that is the known promoter for these genes. And on, on the bottom, that is the novel promoter. And sometimes the association is stronger. Sometimes differences are not as strong. But for some cases, we also see an opposite effect, indicating really that the choice of promoter might be important and that not all of the promoters um, uh, that are important are comprehensively annotated. So to summarize this part, um, I've illustrated this project where we generated the full-length transcriptome data set for gastric cancer cell lines across different subtypes. So that by itself is really a huge resource to understand variation in different gastric cancer and different gastric cancers. We showed that the long-read data can be used to study, no study novel transcript isoforms and also alternative promoters. And by combining these data sets with short-read data that's publicly available, we can study the association again with survival. We do see that there seems to be a usage of alternative promoters that can potentially be biologically important. OK, so just the last slide. Um, I've not talked about this today much, but we also developed methods for long-read RNA-seq data analysis. And so I wanted to post the GitHub link here. You can try out these methods and um, let us know what you think. We're always happy about feedback. OK, with that, I'd like to thank everyone involved here, in particular for the first project that's a former PhD student, Dennis Demerciolo, who developed Proactive, and also Joseph Lee, who was a visiting student, who really greatly contributed to the implementation of Proactive, who um, made it available through Bioconductor and who also developed this workflow. So if you try that out, it should be nicely documented. I also want to particularly thank, of course, Patrick Tan, who was a close coll collaborator for both of these projects, for the Peacock project, and of course, who was the main person behind the Gastric Cancer project together with uh, Wang from his lab. Right, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening to this talk. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions.